It was known simply as the Peaceful Revolution. In the weeks which led up to the Berlin Wall, further southwest in Leipzig were the first real large demonstrations, the first show of force against the regime in the former eastern Germany. On the 9th of October 1989, tens of thousands of people gathered around the Nikolai Kirche, the St. Nicholas Church, before flooding out onto the streets of Leipzig. Already for several years, every Monday, Protestant churches in the city had held prayers for peace, which brought together East Germans, craving freedom and change. Those prayers monitored closely by the infamous Stasi secret police. Well, two days before the 9th, the father of Perestroika, the political movement for change within the Communist Party, Mikhail Gorbachev, had been hailed a hero on the streets of Leipzig. That, after the number two of the East German regime, Egon Krenz, had threatened the demonstrators with a Chinese solution, referring, of course, to the repression of demonstrations on Tiananmen Square in China just a few months earlier. But on the 9th itself, with the 8,000 police who'd been mobilised, were simply overwhelmed by the peaceful crowd. For the first time, the demonstrators no longer afraid. This is the first time in years there's been a protest like this in East Germany. Now there's a reason to be optimistic. We can finally speak freely. The church had never had a successful revolution before this. There was no blood spilt or property damaged. Nobody died. Empowered, the demonstrations soon spread across the country. And a month later, the Berlin Wall fell. Today, Leipzig is one of the most successful cities in the former East Germany. But despite the passage of time, well, the standard of living remains much lower than in the West. And the far right remains strong, particularly since the influx of refugees in 2015. The 1989 activists, though, fighting still against nationalism and racism. 30 years then after the peaceful revolution, Anne Maier and Gulliver Crag revisit Leipzig for France 24. We passed in front of the station and then started down this big avenue. It was absolutely packed with people by the time we got here. And then we carried on walking in this direction in order to get to the ring road. That evening, the fear was gone. On the 9th of October 1989, Christoph Vonneberger, a Lutheran pastor, led his parishioners and other young people to the biggest anti-government demonstration East Germany had yet seen. Tens of thousands of leaflets like this one were handed out, calling for police restraint. It says, we belong to the same people. We who are protesting in the street and you, the police in uniform, we belong together. Do not fire on your fellow citizens. That evening, Christoph was live on West German TV, his account the first to be broadcast around the world. Die DDR-Führung und die Protestwelle. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Auch an diesem Montag, wie schon in den Wochen zuvor, Demonstrationen auf den Straßen von Leipzig. Und war ich telefonisch verbunden mit Pastor Christoph Wonneberger von der Leipziger Lukas-Gemeinde. Spannung wie die war zum. The atmosphere was explosive. Also. Really, we didn't know if our leaflets had had any effect or if civil war would break out. Uwe Schwaber was also at the forefront of the protest movement in Leipzig. Today, he works at the city's Museum of Contemporary History. This was a great action by an opposition member in Leipzig that's shown in this display. He was under permanent surveillance by the political police and he decided to flip things around. He set up his camera in front of the police headquarters and he started photographing the agents. Uwe Schwaber was 27 in 1989. He too found the surveillance society of the GDR unbearable. 
he longed for freedom. Imagine, we couldn't travel, we couldn't study what we wanted, we had no access to books or music. To young people, those things were very important. We wanted to listen to the Rolling Stones and we knew that we'd never be able to see them in concert, or maybe when we were old, but we thought by then the Rolling Stones wouldn't be around anymore. We had this constant feeling we weren't free, that our lives were determined by a regime that wouldn't let us find fulfillment. And there came this point in the 1980s when we just couldn't take it anymore. The 9th of October 1989 was a turning point in the GDR. The collapse of the regime accelerated. East Germany's communist dictatorship was losing control. Thirty years later, thousands of candles commemorate the protesters' bravery. This was a grassroots revolution, achieved by people who were no older than I am today. It's thanks to them. This is where it happened. If people had not had the courage to come out in the streets here 30 years ago, the wall would not have fallen. To come out this evening, the people of Leipzig again had to wrestle with fear. That afternoon, a far-right extremist had attacked a synagogue in the nearby city of Halle, killing two people. It is all the more essential that we are here this evening for this gathering and this commemoration to say again, loud and clear, in the spirit of 1989, no to violence. That's our message to the world this evening. In the crowd at the commemoration, Nina and Charlotte are handing out leaflets. Left-wing activists, they were born after the wall came down, but are following in the footsteps of their parents, who were there at that momentous October the 9th protest. Though they hesitated to come after the attack in Halle cast a heavy shadow over the occasion, they feel it's more important than ever to speak out about the shortcomings of German reunification. We're here to pay tribute to the strength and courage of the protesters, but we're also here to say that many of the hopes and dreams of those protesters have still not come to fruition. It's not enough to just celebrate. We have to speak about successes, but also about everything that didn't work out these past 30 years. The two Germanys scrambled to reunite in under a year with the East undergoing a painful transition to a market economy. Leipzig is still dotted with long derelict factories, vestiges of the communist era. This former crane factory is being converted into flats, a process Dieter Bitterman observes ruefully. He used to work here. You see those balconies? They're not original, they've been added. Dieter Bitterman was an engineer at Takraf, an East German industrial behemoth typical of the Soviet era. In the 1980s, the GDR economy was on the verge of implosion. But factories still kept most of their staff on the payroll. It was after the wall fell that people started to lose their jobs. The average age of workers in 1990 was 48, and most of them never found another job after that. It's really sad to think about it. Dieter and his colleagues here witnessed the collapse of the East German economy, a whole world that fell apart in just a few months, leaving only photos, models, memories and hatred of the Treuhand the institution tasked with privatizing East Germany's economy. It shut down a third of all the country's companies. In the end, the whole of the GDR, including Leipzig, was deindustrialized. All the big factories, their thousands of employees and their products, completely disappeared. It could have been done in a more humane way. With the privatization of businesses after the wall fell, more than 80% of industrial jobs in the city were lost.
For many in Leipzig, reunification meant first and foremost mass unemployment. Two and a half million East Germans lost their jobs, giving way to despair and disillusion and making the region fertile terrain for extremist views. But with the turn of the century, the city turned the corner. Thanks to subsidies and investments, the economy began to flourish again. Big businesses moved in and a few from the former era survived, albeit with drastically reduced workforces. Kiro makes specialised railway equipment. Stefan Dulsner is among the few employees it kept on. There used to be 2,500 of us working here. In 1989, we had only one question on our minds. What will become of us? Stefan and others like him had to adapt to the idea of life without job security. The GDR prioritised the principle of jobs for all over productivity. 30 years later, Stefan feels he has been lucky, and Leipzig too. In the past three years, 20,000 new jobs have been created in the city. I see the evolution positively. Leipzig has developed little by little, and now we are seeing the benefits of the new industrial poles that have been set up in the city. Like 85% of bosses in these eastern regions, the owner of Kiro is from West Germany. After buying the company for a symbolic one Deutschmark in 1994, it took Ludwig Kerner 20 years to make it competitive again. His big worry now, though, is the rise of the far right in this area. If they manage to establish themselves here, it'll become impossible to persuade intelligent people, people with ideas, to move to this region. No one will want to come and work here, and it'll be a catastrophe for the company if we can't get the personnel. Since 1990, Leipzig has tended to favour the Social Democrats. Nevertheless, the far-right AFD party got nearly 18% of the vote here in the last regional elections. In the surrounding region of Saxony, it scored 27%. One of its MPs, Siegbert Drözer, rather opportunistically suggests this success is also down to the spirit of 89. Here in 1989, we learned that a peaceful revolution is possible when the population is dissatisfied. And the inhabitants of Saxony have always been rebels. Siegbert Drözer is among the AFD's founder members. Created in 2013, the xenophobic party suddenly took center stage during the refugee crisis of 2015. In a few short years, it has become the second biggest party in Saxony. The MP proudly shows us his collection of posters disfigured by his opponents. Often they draw a Hitler moustache on me, but I haven't got any examples of that here. It makes me laugh, the trouble they go to. Siegbert is a proud proponent of anti-immigration, identity-based politics. But what really makes the AFD popular in these regions is East Germans' economic malaise. The AFD's election campaigns channel this frustration. It comes out in all our discussions with voters. They feel neglected, not considered to be real Germans. And above all, they feel that many promises that were made have not been kept. Salaries are not the same in the East as in the West, nor are pensions. That makes people angry. And we as a party do not hesitate to address these issues. Arguments that are gaining traction across Eastern Germany, even in this region, which is now the richest in the former GDR. Leipzig is also popular with students and artists, many of whom deplore the rise of the AFD, but nevertheless understand the feeling that East Germans have been second-class citizens these past 30 years. Nina and Charlotte have even seen members of their own families turn to the far-right party. They see the roots of the problem in the reunification process. We need to meet with and listen to these people and tell them it's not the refugees who've moved to Germany, who only represent a tiny percentage of the population. They're not responsible for all our problems. Our problems come from 1989 and what happened in the years immediately after that, when West Germany imposed its rules on us. 
The AFD is exploiting the memory of the revolution. It's true, we had a revolution before we went out into the streets and it worked, except that what the AFD represents has nothing to do with the ideals of that era. That's why the protesters of that era are speaking out again today, 30 years later, to make sure people know the real story of their fight for freedom. Uwe Schwaber and others have been giving numerous public talks about the true spirit of 89. Recent political developments have made him a civil rights activist once again. I cannot tolerate the far-right positioning itself today as the incarnation of the spirit of 89 and the peaceful revolution. It must be opposed as firmly as possible. In those days, our aims were completely different. We wanted a free country, an open society. We wanted democracy. And the far-right doesn't want any of that. All they want is to impose their vision on the world, and they don't want an open and free society. We have to fight this. Thirty years after its peaceful revolution, Leipzig's economic transformation is a success. It's one of Germany's most dynamic cities. But the democratic transition is still throwing up challenges. The wall in our heads, as some East Germans call it, is not yet fully gone. The wall in our heads, as some East Germans call it, is still standing. Anne Maé and Gulliver Craig revisiting Leipzig for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website. That's at france24.com. More news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.